Donald Trump called him tough. Rush Limbaugh read one of his articles live on his radio show. Ann Coulter tweeted that article to her one and a half million followers and declared, every sentence is perfect. Ladies and gentlemen, your host, former chief editor of the Jewish Press, Elliot Resnick. Welcome to the Elliot Resnick Show, to raise children who are Yirei Shemayim, productive and happy. That's the aim of just about every sincerely from parent. Unfortunately, much confusion currently abounds on how to achieve this aim. Mrs. Rebecca Mesinter is the mother of six and the author of a weekly parenting column based on the Parsha of the Week. She is also a great-great-niece of the famed Muster personality Rav Elia Lapian and the daughter of Rabbi Daniel Lapin, founder of Tawar Tradition and the host of his own TV show and podcast. Mrs. Mesinter, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. If you don't mind, I'd like to begin by asking you why parenting columns are necessary altogether. John Rosemond, the author of many best-selling books on raising children, has argued that parents bring up their kids so poorly nowadays because they refuse to use their common sense and instead rely on so-called experts who base their opinions not on common sense or experience, but on subjective value judgments. So, for example, basic common sense and decency tells you that if you're in a restaurant with your family, you shouldn't allow your four-year-old to disturb all the patrons in the restaurant trying to enjoy their dinner. And yet, many parents allow their children to do just just that. Since modern experts claim, based on nothing but their own biases, that restraining such a child might harm his self-esteem or inhibit his self-expression. Many parents also refrain from ever saying the word no to their children based on professional advice, even though common sense tells you that saying no is essential to running a functioning household, maintaining your sanity, and forming a child's moral character. My question, therefore, is, are parenting columns really necessary, or is it more important for parents to just allow themselves to trust their common sense and raise their kids the way their grandparents, for example, would have raised their own parents? And that's an excellent question. I do not disagree with John Rosamond, but I think if the reality was that people were able to raise their children with the same level of common sense that their grandparents may have had, we wouldn't be in the situation we're in today. Today, we're in the second or third generation where parents don't have the common sense that you refer to, to know what's right and what's wrong in raising a child. So much of what's surrounding us today is a culture that promotes self-fulfillment, fun, all those things that raising children actually goes against. You know, it's a lot harder to raise a child with structure and discipline and not go to the restaurant with your child until they're ready to behave than it is to drag them along and let them do what they want so you can have the dinner you want to have, regardless of what the other patrons there having their experience be impacted by your child. So I just don't think there is common sense out there. If someone is so fortunate enough to be that they were raised with a tremendously strong hadracha and they saw their parents raise them and they want to carry it on, of course they should be tapping into their common sense. But I think now we need to help parents access, common sense isn't even the real word, but, but true, authentic inner wisdom of parenting. And yes, those parents have it deep inside of them. But it takes work. It takes real work and thought to get down to your inner sense of what is your value system and what do you want to give to your children and how are you going to do that? And it's going to go against all the instincts that we've been impacted by our society around us, which has taken away the culture that supports healthy families. It's taken away a culture that supports respect from children to parents. It's taken away the authority that parents used to have, a sense of I'm the mom. And that's all you need to know. Parents don't feel that anymore. They feel like they have imposter syndrome. Many philosophers of parenting, and that's what I like to call them usually because they're not experts or professionals. They're just philosophers and superficial ones at that. They claim that it's good for parents to share their fears and their vulnerabilities with their children. In a recent parenting column that you wrote, you seem to argue the very opposite. I wonder if you could share what you wrote with the audience. Sure. I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, the one you referred to, it's when Moshe is telling Yehoshua that you have to be strong and courageous, le'enei kol b'nei Yisrael, I think might be the words, before the eyes of the whole Jewish people. And there are two ways to learn that. You can learn that as you have to be strong and courageous before all the people, 
or that in the eyes of the people, you appear as if you're strong and courageous, meaning maybe you don't feel it deep inside. But before those people, when they look at you, they see a leader who's confident, who's strong and courageous. And both aspects are important in any leader and in any parent. I think it is very important that a child looking at their parents feels that their parents have what it takes to take care of them. Their parents project an image of confidence. I think it is incredibly damaging for a child to feel that his parent is at a loss. I don't know what to do with you. You're more than I can handle. That really, really shakes a child's complete inner core. Like, oh my gosh, I'm more than my parent can take care of. We want to project whether or not we feel it. We have this. We're going to take care of you. Everything's under control. Now, that doesn't mean they're never going to see emotion on a parent. And they should. Of course they should. But when it comes to the child, the emotion of how we feel about raising this child, I think it's really important that we keep our fears, our panic, our anxiety, all that separate from our interactions with our children so that when we are interacting with our children, we're projecting a calm, confident, courageous exterior so that they can absorb that and feel that confidence too. And this is not exactly the same thing, but my mother sometimes relates that when I was, let's say, I don't know, let's say five or six or something, I came into the house and I guess I was playing with a flower and the flower had snapped in half or something. And I brought this flower to my mother and said, Ma, could you please fix the flower for me? And my mother thought that was a great thing for kids to think that their parents could do anything. Absolutely. And even, you know, as a parent of older teenagers and beyond, it thrills me when they call to ask me for help. Of course. Yes, we're here for you. And the older they get, of course, they know that we're not capable of fixing most things in their life. But to know that we've got it, you know, there's nothing they can tell us or show us that's going to throw us, that's going to make us absolutely lose it, that's going to make us feel like we can't cope anymore. You know, whether or not that's true, and there's certainly a lot of things children throw at their parents that make you feel like you really can't cope anymore. That's fine. Just do that in the privacy of your bedroom and then come out and project calmness and confidence. And we got this, we're going to take care of this and move forward. Right. By the way, your explanation of in the eyes of all of Israel, I read the column, I was looking, spent 10, 15 minutes trying to look up the column today to find out which Mefarish interpreted that way. It was a mainstream Mefarish, but I don't remember. I'm not sure if you remember off the top of your head. I apologize. I don't remember. It is possible, but I really may be wrong. For some reason in my mind is either the Hassam Sofer or the Ksav Sofer. But it's on mothersguidance.com, and I, I do usually try to put on there which pairs I'm taking things from. Right. Thank you. And I, that's actually a good moment. So your whole website is called mothersguidance.com, right? That's where all your columns are? It's the English of Torah Simacha, which is uh, where I originally started when I was speaking just to a, an audience of from women. And Torah Simacha has morphed into Mother's Guidance. You address now both from and non from. I'm speaking to everybody and anybody who's interested in a authentic Torah influenced approach to parenting. So it's not necessarily even Jews. There are many Christians who would be interested in Jewish wisdom. What does Jewish wisdom have to say about parenting? Right. And that's what I provide. Very nice. Okay, great. Um, Abigail Schreier, the author of Irreversible Damage, which was the first book in America to expose the harms of the transgender movement, specifically the harms it inflicts upon teenagers. She just published a new book called Bad Therapy, Why the Kids Aren't Growing Up. I'd like to read part of the book description on Amazon and get your reaction. So this is what it says on Amazon. In virtually every way that can be measured, Gen Z's mental health is worse than that of previous generations. Youth suicide rates are climbing. Antidepressant prescriptions for children are common. And the proliferation of mental health diagnoses has not helped the staggering number of kids who are lonely, lost, sad, and fearful of growing up. What's gone wrong with America's youth? In Bad Therapy, best-selling investigative journalist Abigail Schreier argues that the problem is not the kids, it's the mental health experts. Drawing on hundreds of interviews with child psychologists, parents, teachers, and young people, Schreier explores the ways the mental health industry has transformed the way we teach, treat, discipline, and even talk to our kids. She reveals that most of the therapeutic approaches have serious side effects and few proven benefits. Among her unsettling findings, one, talk therapy can induce rumination, trapping children in cycles of anxiety and depression. Two, social emotional learning handicaps our most vulnerable children in both public schools and private. And three, gentle parenting can encourage emotional turbulence, even violence in children as they lash out desperate for an adult in charge. Your reaction. 
Abigail Schreier is a very courageous woman, an insightful woman, a wise woman. I enjoy a lot of what she writes, and I'm really excited to get to read this book because I have it on hold at the library. And I don't want to, you know, it's an incredibly complex topic to talk about mental health. It's everywhere today. And so I don't want to go ahead and completely bash and say that there's no room for therapy and there are no children who need help. However, I think it is incredibly important, again, that parents empower themselves to understand that almost all the time, the first thing your child needs is a parent. And you hold the answers. You are the one who can look in your child's face in the morning and see, is he okay? Is he not okay? Do things look right? Does he sound right? Or are they off? And if something's off, it doesn't mean you need to go right away to an expert. You actually are the expert in your child. And so you need to take the time to, again, be calm and clear and tap into your confidence and your inner knowledge. And you can very often help your child and deal with whatever it is that they're struggling with, with your own co-host, with what you have. And it might mean you need help for that. But ultimately, you are your child's parent because Hashem picked you out of every single human being throughout the entirety of history and around the world to be the parent to your child because you are the absolute best one there is. That's it. So I think that's very important. And the other piece Abigail Schreier speaks about is the general weakness, I suppose you could say, of children today. And she connects it to gentle parenting. And I think the concept that we're going to make life perfect for our children, that life should be perfect for our children, is completely untrue. It's not a Torah worldview, and it's not reality. There is no such thing as a perfectly happy childhood. There is no such thing as a perfectly happy adulthood. There's no such thing as a perfect parent or a perfect child. Our children need to learn to live in this world with its bumps and its scrapes and its pains and all the difficult things that happen and get up and move on because they see that in us. They see the resilience in us and they see that we're not thrown when something bad happens to them. You know, it's going to happen. You're going to have a teacher who's very unfair to your child for whatever reason. When they see your reaction, they're going to be able to tell, well, is this a really big deal or this is just life? Sometimes teachers make mistakes or sometimes they have a bad day and we're just going to move on. No big deal. And I don't know when the podcast is going to air, but right now we're a week before Purim. And I feel like that's the story of Megillas Esther. Megillas Esther is not a fairy tale. For every four-year-old who wants to dress up as Queen Esther, the adults who look at the story should feel a much, much more complicated emotional reaction. You know, Esther Amalka sacrificed herself. She sacrificed her personal future. She sacrificed her personal happiness. She sacrificed her personal fulfillment. It's not a Disney fairy tale. And Purim doesn't even end with a Geula. Purim ends and we're still in Gullus. And despite that, that's the month, that's the holiday where we're supposed to be, Basimcha, where we're supposed to be, Marbin Basimcha. And we kind of teach our children often that happiness is when everything is going great. I'm going to give you everything you want, and I'm going to make life easy for you, and then you'll be happy. And what Purim teaches us is actually the exact opposite, that Simcha is not connected to everything going great. It's not Pesach. Purim is a holiday where things were not going great, where even the Yeshua was still difficult. And despite that, we're besimcha. So happiness is not something that we can give our children by giving them everything they want and being gentle parents, if that's the term you want to use, and never saying no to them. That's not where happiness comes from. Happiness comes from working through difficult things, from living and choosing to be happy, making the choice that you're going to be besimcha even while you acknowledge that life has really hard parts to it. And that's okay. That's not a bad thing. It's not something to run away from. It's not something to avoid. And I think this is something parents can really communicate to their children in subconscious ways in the way that they approach difficulties and challenges and painful experiences. We don't have to be scared of them. We can be happy even when things are really hard. Two things on this topic that I found interesting in Abigail Schreier's book. She says, number one, Focusing on feelings often is not a smart idea, she said, because she's quoting really somebody else, some dissident psychologist, I guess you would say, who said, if you ask yourself, are you happy? Uh, Most of the day, actually, you're not happy. You might not be mad or sad, but you're not happy. So as soon as you focus on happiness, you say, am I happy? Oh, one second, I'm not happy. Why am I not happy? So it winds up making problems worse for everyone, adults and children, if you constantly focus on happiness. And number two, she quoted some sort of study that shows that in general, 
there are two things you can focus on. You can focus on, I forget the exact technical language, but you can focus on your emotional well-being, your state of mind. Am I happy? Am I feeling successful? Whatever it is. Or you can focus on action. What do I need to do right now? What should I be doing right now? And studies have found that if you focus on action rather than your inner state of being, you actually wind up accomplishing much more and wind up being much happier in the end anyways. Absolutely. That's very fascinating. And I think, again, so much of parenting work is work that parents actually have to do within themselves. And this, I think, is one of those areas where parents have to be okay with their children not being happy. And that's hard. It hurts us when our children are sad. You know, there's this famous line, I don't know where it originated, a mother is only as happy as her least happy child. I don't believe that's the Torah's approach. I just don't think that's right. We have to be okay with our children not being happy. Our job is to be the parent to sometimes say no, to sometimes let our children deal with things that are painful and difficult, and be okay when they're not happy about it. And when we're okay with their distress, when they see that we're not panicking and falling apart because they're unhappy, it puts their feelings in perspective too. Like, okay, I'm going crazy, I'm really upset, but but I'm a child. Look at mom and dad, they're okay, this must really be okay. At what age would you recommend parents allowing a child to have a cell phone? And at what age would you recommend they allow him or her, if ever, to own a smartphone? It's a big question. And it's one that each couple has to really work through themselves and figure out and be honest. And I cannot make a blanket recommendation. I can tell you that in our experience, the later, the better. And it really takes thought, like so much of parenting. It really takes intentionality. You know, what is the purpose? Why do I feel my child needs a cell phone? You know, if a child is beginning to drive and you want them to have a phone so that if something happens, they're able to reach you, that doesn't have to be a smartphone. It doesn't even have to have texting. You just want them to have something that can make a call. In our house, we have a driving phone. It's a drawer in my desk. And when one of our kids is going driving somewhere or going to babysit in a house which does not have a landline, which I really think is a challenge. I don't think families should do that if you want a babysitter to come. But the babysitter in our family, we send our own because I don't want them to be in a home that, God forbid, something happens and they have no way to reach for help. Right. Um, But that's not a smartphone. And even if a child does have their own phone, you want to be intentional. And, you know, there are such things called cell phone contracts. Google them. They're all over. And it's very wise to have parents sit down and say, like, what is our contract with our child? What do we want? Let's be clear. Let's lay out our expectations. Are we going to allow the cell phone in your bedroom? Are we going to allow it upstairs? Do all cell phones have to be turned off and put in a central charging station at a certain time at night? You know, what are the boundaries that you're going to set for your children? So when you do it, I think the important thing to know is this is not easy. You're going to constantly have to be evaluating and thinking. And as the technology changes, parents have to keep upping their knowledge I remember the first time one of our children needed internet access on a computer, so we set up a children's computer with a special login just for this kid to be able to access only certain sites. It turned out that a little bit later, Microsoft Word changed so that their search function accessed the internet. So now a child can search for an image, and it's not just Microsoft's clip art collection, but it's the whole internet. Well, back to the drawing board, you know, what we thought we had set up with all the filters and everything in place, no good. So we're constantly, if if your child has access to technology, the responsibility is on parents to constantly stay on top of what's happening, stay on top of the way technology is changing, the way apps are changing, the way programs that you thought were perfectly benign and fine 20 years ago or 10 years ago or three years ago, you have to always be looking at it. And it's an investment. Right. And on so many different levels, there could be harms. I'm just having to think of just one particular area because the culture is changing so crazily. So I think recently I was Googling or in, either in Google or some program marriage. And like, I don't know, like maybe I think the 10 of the top 20 images were just of two men, not a man and woman. That's just like one example among many where you think something's innocent and you don't realize how non-innocent things are becoming in so many different ways. A hundred percent. And I think just like the parents have a responsibility to clear any book or magazine or something that comes into the house that the child can read physically, it's a job. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of time. It's the same thing for digital. If you're not able and willing to put in the time, then you just shouldn't do it at all. And the other thing I think it's important to think about is very often parents use technology as the babysitter. You know, the mother needs 
a five minute break, a 20 minute break and social use technology to give her children, to give her that break. And emotionally and psychologically, there's an awful lot that our brains are changing based on technology and children's brains especially are so soft and pliable that I would do everything possible to avoid giving your young children access to technology, using it as a babysitter. Uh, the best analogy I've heard is to treat it the way you would treat a chocolate chip cookie. That once a child has had a completely full, nutritious meal, having a cookie at the end of the meal for dessert is not the end of the world. But having a cookie when the child is hungry and drained and tired and cranky and then you give the cookie, that's not helpful. It's actually going to do damage. And so the same thing for a child's emotional needs to use technology to soothe boredom or anxiety or sadness or loneliness. That's like giving the cookie in place of dinner. They need a, a mother. They need a relationship. They need a person to be with them. But when a child is completely full emotionally and psychologically, and they're not feeling empty or yearning or bored or anxious, it's not the end of the world at that point to let them use careful technology. I think many parents aren't so crazy about giving their kids phones, but then they say, well, everyone else in the class has it, or at least that's what the kid tells them anyways. And they feel just very bad. They, if everyone has it in the class, I don't want to say no to my son or my daughter, especially. How do you respond to that? Yeah, that's a big question. And again, each couple has to figure this out for themselves. I think there's one very important point here, which is that if you are going to expect your child to be different than everybody else, in their class or the perception that everybody else has something, it can't come when they're 14 or 16 or however old it is and the cell phones are the issue. It has to be something that's built into your family culture from day one. And if from day one your family is unique and you do what's best for you and you think through your own decisions and you are not making decisions based on what every single neighbor and classmate is doing, then the natural progression is that as your children get older, they know this is how our family works. When there's a question, mommy and daddy think about it and they talk about it and they get an input if they need to and they make the best decision for our family. And it won't be a big surprise then when you have an intentional, thoughtful approach to technology that may or may not be very different than everybody else's. But if your child grew up in a home where you are always doing what everyone else does and you're always noticing what everybody else is wearing and what they're eating and where they're going on vacation and what their houses look like and everything else, well, then it's not fair to all of a sudden when they hit teenagehood say, oh, now you have to be okay being different. That's too late. So if you're going to build a family where you are the leaders and where you determine what's right for your family, it has to start very young. It's not fair to take a teenager who's all along been raised as, well, you know, what's most important is what everyone else is doing and saying, and then a teenage should say, oh, no, never mind. We don't care what they're doing. We're not letting you. Yeah. Uh, it has to start much earlier. We had a conversation last week, and you told me, I thought this was interesting, that you raised your children on that philosophy to such a degree, you said that when there was a point that your, your son did not have a phone, the rest of the class had a phone, and they almost were teasing your son, and you minded the fact they were teasing your son, but your son had been so indoctrinated that it's okay for me to be different that he didn't mind that, that everyone was teasing him. Yeah, so he didn't see it as teasing. I told you a story that when my son was in 12th grade, he did not have WhatsApp, he didn't have a smartphone, and I found out that the class WhatsApp chat was called Everybody But My Son's Name. And he actually didn't see it as teasing. I don't think it even was. Right. Uh, he was the only one to not on the chat. I was bothered by that. You know, I felt badly that my son was left out. And we did make changes at that point. But you're right. He, I found out almost very inadvertently. He was not upset. This was just the way things were. And he had to work around. You know, he had people who would call him and tell him when there was something being posted, a schedule change or, you know, a class get together or something. And uh, yeah, he, he was okay with it. But, uh. But we did. We did figure out a way to get him access to WhatsApp after that. Okay, so uh, this is a team of a long question, but this country was founded to a large extent on the ideas of John Locke. Locke believed that no man may force another man to do anything, that we all have a divine right to liberty. And yet, parents clearly may force their children to brush their teeth, to cross the street only if an adult is with them, etc. So the question is why, and Locke's answer was simple. He said an adult has a right to liberty only because that adult is already constrained by the law of reason. Children, however, are not constrained by the law of reason because their rational faculties are not yet developed. Therefore, as Locke put it, he that understands for him, meaning the parent, must will for him too. 
end quote. So nowadays, as you, of course, know, parents who embrace the latest popular parenting advice refrain from telling the children to do anything. Rather than offering instruction and leadership, they try to cajole and manipulate their children by giving them false choices and then asking all sorts of leading questions until they get the answer that they want. I always thought this practice was silly and dishonest, but after I read Locke's comments on children, I realized that a parent who doesn't provide instruction to his or her child is acting criminally in a sense in that he's withholding from the child something that that child desperately needs but does not yet possess, which is the wisdom of reason. You have the missing piece of your child's happiness, but you're refusing to give it to him. I wonder what you make of this argument. I think that that's really fascinating and has a lot, a lot of merit on its side. It reminds me of our, you know, that there's no chiras without charas, right? You have to be channeled and limited before you can actually have freedom. And 100%, I believe parents are responsible for guiding and creating limits and boundaries and controlling the situations around their young children to allow them to flourish and to succeed. And you can't put that on a child. They don't have the capability to do that. You know, there's different stages of childhood. And so when you say child, I don't mean that it's the same thing for a five-year-old and a 15-year-old. I think in general, right. the under 10 crowd needs strong parental leadership. And that is when a parent is going to say, no, you may not watch that. Yes, you may look at that. You know, no, you may not stay up late. Or yes, tonight you can. A child can't, can't make those choices. They need the, the leadership. And as they get older, that's when you slowly start giving them room to discuss where, you know, I might have a book that I'm not willing to put out for my younger children to read. But my 13-year-old comes and I might say to her, you know, why don't we read this together? Or I'll put sticky notes on certain pages, like, let's discuss when you get up to here. And sometimes they'll come to me and say, you know, I actually, I'm not ready for this, mommy. I don't want to read it now. And that's okay, too. You know, I'm, we're try I'm trying to slowly give them a little bit more ownership over their choices slowly with guidance and with many other limits in place because ultimately we need children who are going to have the, the confidence, the discipline, the self-control to make those decisions for themselves and to bring it back to the Torah. We have chukim and we have mishpat and we have many different types of mitzvahs and some of them are straightforward. Hashem said do it, we do it. End of story. That's it. And some we have our mishpatim, like where Rashi says that Moshe is supposed to lay it out before B'nai Yisrael, like a set table, which means with the full explanations, this is why this is so important that, you know, you don't let your ox gore another one, or this is how we treat other people, and it has to be a full understanding. And I think both have to be there in parenting as well, that there are some parts of parenting where it's just because I said so. I'm the mommy, and I make the decision. And then there are other parts in parenting where we might explain, this is why I said, no, it's not a good idea today. Or this is what I'm thinking about. I'm trying to decide. I'll let you know when I do make a decision. But these are the factors I'm considering. And share it with your children so that they can begin to learn what goes into making a responsible, well-informed decision. Right. You know, some people, it's so extreme nowadays, they'll ask like a five-year-old, would you like to bench? Instead of just saying, now we just had a Shabbos meal, now's the time to bench, and now it's time to thank Hashem. They don't have that direction or instruction. They're constantly asking these questions. The kid doesn't know. The kid's five or six. He's not developed. He can't think rationally about what he is supposed to do. He just knows what his mood is telling him to do this second. I think you're actually raising a very important point, and it goes back to the beginning of our conversation that we're so influenced by the world around us, which is no longer healthy for families. If you listen to parents today, many of their interactions with their children, their sentences end with question marks. I believe that if you would go back 70 years, most of parents' interactions with young children would end in periods. And so, you know, assuming that common sense today is there, no, it's not. But what young parents of young children can work on is removing the question marks and going back to statements. As you said, you know, now we're going to bench. End of sentence. It's good for everybody. It's good for the parent. I think it's good for the children also. First of all, it's also more, more honest, but it's also huh? kids that I think are yearning for leadership and direction. They're not old enough to make their own. Yeah. I think John Roseman once said, because people talk about happy children, and you're right, that shouldn't be the aim. But even if you're thinking about happy children, he said, you ever see a kid who's spoiled and a brat? Does he look happy as he's having that temper tantrum? Kids who are allowed to do whatever they want are not happy, actually. Right. And it goes back to that, that they really do need to feel that their parents are confident and in control. And you don't project control and confidence with question marks. You do with statements. 
Okay, I just want to end with a topic which I know you're also very much involved in, which is homeschooling. In recent years, the number of children who are being homeschooled in America has vastly increased as more and more parents no longer trust their local schools to provide as proper and wholesome an education as they would like. As a from homeschooler yourself, have you seen a similar rise in the number of homeschooled children among from Jews? That's a really great question, and there has been a rise that I've seen in the firm homeschooling world, but I don't think it's for the same reasons as in the general population. I think we're very fortunate. We have our own schools, and they are teaching Torah values and and wonderful in every way. I do think COVID shifted a lot of families who, you know, maybe their children really did not thrive with certain COVID regulations in the schools. And that drove many families to look at homeschooling. Then a number of those families are still homeschooling. But I don't think it's in reaction to a changing culture in our schools that's troublesome. Okay, I guess I'll grant you that. Although I think secularism has infiltrated from schools also to a certain degree. But okay, I guess probably not nearly as much as it has in the regular schools. So let me just ask you then that question, which also people constantly say that... Um, kids who are homeschooled, they're going to be very socially awkward. They're not going to to know how to interact with other people, other kids. What do you say to that claim? I wish you that you should get to spend time with many, many homeschooled children because they're wonderful. I think you can have socially awkward people in school and you can have socially awkward people outside of school. And very often it has to do with the parents and the the family structure. So I I don't think that's a, a fair generalization. And from my experience, I would say that the homeschooled children that I see, that I interact with, are, I would say, unusually kind and sensitive and socially aware. And they're interacting with many, many, many people. You know, I don't, this is a, it's a false construct to say that socialization only exists within people born within 12 months of your birth date. You know, that's not the way the world works. And so homeschool children are, are going to play with kids who are a little bit older, a little bit younger. Actually, as we speak, one of my daughters is finishing up production of a homeschool Purim play that she and a friend are directing a whole cast of girls who are younger and putting on a Purim play. And it's been smooth and easy and pleasant, and they're learning to lead and to help and to work out issues that come up between different girls who want different parts or different things. These are other homeschooled kids that she's directing? These are other homeschooled children, okay. yes. Uh, both the directors and the actresses are, are homeschooled. And if you're willing to open up, you know, and, and that means she's spending time with not only girls her own age, she's spending time with a bunch of six to nine year olds right now running this play. But she's loving it and it's wonderful. And at one and the same time, she's also getting, you know, all the homeschooled children have the opportunity to interact with older people, to volunteer at nursing homes, to visit neighbors who are elderly. When you have more time in your day, you have more opportunities to reach out to all types of people and contribute to different chastadim and organizations who need volunteers all the time. Those are the homeschooled kids that I see. They're using the extra time in their day to be very, very, very social. They're volunteering and they have jobs and their mother's helpering and they're teaching classes. And I think they're wonderful kids. And I will say that when my children were younger and we would have friends over who were in school, it was sometimes it was something I needed to monitor more closely than when homeschooled kids came over because there's a lot of attitudes and midos. There are things that are much harder to teach when you're teaching a group of children. When people used to ask me, if I'm not worried about my young boys not being in school, I would say the last thing I want them to do is learn how to behave appropriately from a bunch of 27-year-old boys. I'd rather them learn from me. And so I personally, I don't think the, the socialization argument is one that I've seen as having legs. There was a book on teenagerhood that I read years ago. The author's well, main thesis was there is no such thing as teenagerhood. And in making that argument, he says that even till today, if you go around most of the world, because they're, they're poor countries, less developed countries, so the kids are working from a very young age. He says around the world, kids spend most of their day around adults. It's only in America and rich countries in the West that kids spend most of their day around fellow kids. And he was arguing that it's actually better for kids' development to be around adults most of the day rather than fellow kids most of the day. I would not disagree. And I think the, the whole adolescence piece is also hugely fascinating because that is a very, very, very modern construct. It didn't exist until about World War II. And so, yeah, the idea that teenagers, this in-between class, is something we've created along with all its problems. Could you maybe elaborate just a teeny bit what you mean by that? Sure. Um, Going back 100 years, a child was a child until they were 
really an adult. You know, even in the way they would dress, a child would dress like a child, and then at a certain age, a girl would put up her hair or wear long skirts, and a boy would start wearing long pants, and they would go to work. And at that point, they were treated pretty much like adults. And after World War II, this whole teenagehood kind of came into existence where you're kind of a child, kind of an adult, but really neither. And many people don't have a great understanding of what this stage should be and how we should be helping our children move from childhood into adulthood. And you see it with many people who actually never leave adolescence. No matter how biologically old they are, their minds and feelings and behaviors are still adolescent. And so I do think that learning how to help your child go from childhood to adulthood, which is what that bridge of adolescence is supposed to be, is something that parents should be investing in and learning in. And a lot of that is, yeah, giving them opportunities to take responsibility, giving them jobs, giving them chances to interact with other people, with mentors, with people they can look up to and spend time with. And we're fortunate. In our world, we have a lot of that built in. You know, from the time a boy is bar mitzvah, he's davening with other men three times a day. He's got a potential for built-in role models around him all the time. But we have to be aware of that, that, this is what our children need. And if they don't have it, we have to come up with ways to give it to them in other ways. I bumped into your father around, I would say five years ago. And he said to me that there is no Hebrew word for teenager. And he said that's significant Uh because he thinks Judaism doesn't really recognize this separate category of, I guess, where you're sort of, you know, supposed to be moody all the time and sort of kind of, you know, do what you want. There's no, there's childhood and there's adulthood. And he didn't really have time to elaborate so much, uh, but I thought that was interesting. It is. And you can't change the world around us. Our kids all go to high school. (laughs) You know, that didn't happen in the 1860s. This this is what it is. But to be aware that our goal is with teenagers is to help them transition from childhood to adulthood. Right. It's not to just let them hang out, let them have a good time, and hope that maybe naturally by themselves they'll turn into adults. It doesn't happen. There has to be clear guidance, clear leadership, clear wisdom of, okay, what does it take to help a child turn into an adult? Right. And even, I don't want to generalize too much, but even let's say in uh, in Israel, people are much more mature, much younger because they joined the army at 18 and being in an army matures you. And also like every once in a while, I'll see an interview with like a teenager from the South in America. And they often sound much more mature because a lot of these kids in the South, they're not rich uh, kids, you know, Harvard, just hanging out. They have jobs already as young teenagers. And when you listen to them being interviewed, they sound much more mature as even just like 15 or 16 year olds. They just sound much more mature. It's interesting. And I think it's also important to recognize Hashem put the drive for maturation inside a person. You know, no one has to make a two-year-old want to do things all by themselves. A two-year-old is naturally, Hashem put it in them, this drive, me, myself, and I, like, let me do it. There's a drive that comes out in early adolescence also where a child wants to. They want to do meaningful work. They want to try big things. They want to take on projects. And allowing them to do that, allowing them to take ownership over things, it's important. And sometimes parents are concerned. There's this phrase that's become pretty popular, parentify, that, you know, we don't want to parentify our children and and basically put the responsibilities of adulthood on a child. And that's not what I'm suggesting we do. I think, you know, again, emotionally, psychologically, all those responsibilities lie on the parent. But that does not mean that it's not a good thing to give our children responsibility to give them an opportunity to prove themselves, to do things, to accomplish, and to own their accomplishments. It builds them up. Okay, so I asked the questions I wanted to ask, but sometimes, you know, the person being interviewed has something they want to say that they were never asked about. So is there any things that I didn't ask about that you really wanted to say and, and tell parents about that you think is important? What's important? I think it's most important that, I think I did say it before, that every parent recognizes that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave you your children and he gave your children you because you have the potential to be the absolute best parent to that child. You have it, you own it, and it doesn't mean necessarily that it's easy. It doesn't mean that all your instincts are automatically in line for what that child needs, but you have the capacity. And so invest in yourself and trust yourself and work on yourself to become the parent your child needs because you really have all that potential inside of you. No one less than Akash Baruch himself gave you that vote of confidence by giving you your child. And so I think it's important parents own that confidence that you have what it takes. You can do it. And I hope that you'll look at Mother's Guidance because there are a lot of resources there to help each parent in a way that's aligned with the Torah. 
to figure out how do you parent well and how do you activate the potential within each one of us. I think you also argued recently, it just popped into my head, that it's important for people to keep in mind that there are three partners here. It's not just two people raising a child. Oh, yes. Thank you. That's one of my most favorite and important things to share with parents. I appreciate you reminding me. Um, There are three partners to a child. Everybody knows that. You have a father and mother and Hashem. And very often, even if in our heads that we know differently, emotionally, parents act as if Hashem's role ends at birth. And from then on, it's on our shoulders. And nothing could be further from the truth. Hashem is an active partner in our parenting all the way through our children's lives. He's the most powerful one in that triumvirate. He's the the one who's going to have the most ability to impact them the longest. And when we are feeling stuck and when we are feeling like we don't know what's next and we don't know how to parent, we don't know how to move forward, we're not sure what to do, the best thing to do is to turn to Hashem, to turn to that third partner in your parenting group and say, Hashem, it's your child. Please show me what you want me to do. Show me what you want me to say. And he comes through because he's a partner. He's there with you. And it's like, you know, when Hashem said to Moshe, Bo El Paro, what do you mean, Bo El Paro? Leich, go to Paro. What do you mean, come? And all the Rishonim say, no, 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 Hashem is right there with them. He's saying, come to me. And it's the same thing as a parent. You're not on your own. It's not all on your shoulders. It's not all your responsibility. It's our job to do the best we can, but we have a partner. We have Hashem and He's with us, and we can absolutely tap into that. We can ask for help, and we will receive the guidance and the help we need when we ask for it. Okay, well, thank you very, very much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. All right, that does it for us. If you like this podcast, please consider subscribing to it and giving it a good rating and a nice review if you're so inclined. I hope you enjoyed the episode and have a great day or a great night, depending on when you're listening to this podcast.